Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata. Um, I really love this one. Um, I know I say that a lot about a lot of books and uh, different stories I read, but I, I, I do mean it with this one. This one's like one of those memorable ones that um, it was a little bit of a difficult read because it is pretty starkly like depressing in a lot of areas. Um, the whole tone is very icy, very aloof. Um, it's kind of up in the air. You don't know like what's going to happen. There's a lot of kind of happening. Um, but I l really enjoyed it no, no, nonetheless. Um, so, it, but it was, a, nevertheless, it was a cozy read. It was a kind of a cozy, let's take a look into this, into, um, Yasuneri Kaobata's, um, world for a little bit. Like, let's take a look into his kind of slice of life of, like, what this Japanese little, um, uh, Unsan town, of a, which is a hot spring, and he talks about, Right off the bat, talking about the narr or the protagonist is Shimaneri. Um, Sh I'm sorry, Shimanera, and he is a um, kind of a dilettante, pers uh, educated person who's like in the arts, and he is a ballet kind of con connoisseur of the ballet. But the theme with this is that um, Shimaneri does not ever. Um, ever ha he's never seen an actual ballet in the flesh. Like he's he only studies it discreetly and in private, but has never actually gone into the immersive experience of actually seeing it. And like you know, um, so that's that right of the bat says a lot about him. Um, and he's on a train, and he's looking from afar, and he's uh, sees this other passenger's eye, a beautiful lady that he sees, and he's like kind of watching from afar. And then sees her through the. It goes through like a very interesting the way that um, uh, Kawabata describes this. You know the the, uh, the way he describes it so unique and so, but very much in the tradition of the haiku, uh, especially in the kind of uh, Mitsuo Bashu kind of tradition. And it is very um, the way you know. It's like I think it's like a haiku is like technically it's like seventeen syllables and it's like separated by and it has like a kind of contradictory type of thing too so there's like one you'll like have one half of the ta of the haiku is about one thing and then the other half so this is very about a split kind of uh contradictory kind of thing with the snow country of this uh little hot spring place where it's like there's just one little hot spring and this is like all the way out west um i want to say n southwest japan and uh Excuse me, I'm not so good at the geography of Japan. Um, although um, other authors like Mie Mieka Kawakami and Haruki Murakami have also kind of made me a little bit more kind of interested in like the exact areas of like where, so like where's Fuji, where's um, Osaka in the kind of relation to Tokyo and stuff like that. But even still, I'm, I'm still kind of very much elementary in that. Um, but anyway, so um, yeah, Kawabaji uh, describes very much very detailed but not in a way that's exhausting um the how uh the protagonist is looking at this woman but then you know she's gone obviously so it's like a kind of it's a kind of a another kind of kind of theme it's the exploration of a theme of him uh shumanary not or sorry shumanary uh <laughs> um not uh look but don't like he's very much look but don't touch like look at this person but don't he's very kind of removed from everyday life and he's you know he's educated he's smart you know um and he's no by no means not necessarily impolite but he is very i mean he has a certain amount of niceties but on the surface at least but when you there is no getting to know him there's no he holds himself in very safeguarded and he goes to this um town where in this uh hot spring area and then it's just filled with geishas and it's like the gate you know he's staying there kind of a resort and he's well to do so right now there's a class kind of thing going on and um he's very he comes from an affluent family who's who was able to you know send him to school like his, his parents were able to send him to a good uh nice kind of art school for him to study uh the ballet and in, in the kind of thorough way that he did and he um yeah he's very much um put into this kind of uh, area in the hot, in this, a lot of, there's a, that, just him on the train, like right off the bat, like you get like that verse, that kind of being brought in media res, you know, right in the middle of that story, you're, you know, in this, showing him being dropped off, and it's, um, right off the bat, like the difference between how 
the pro protagonist, you know, with his wealth, and he's been kind of like bubbled and protected by his wealth, and now he's out in this kind of abandoned. Like now he's very, what's the word? It um, like at a loss. Like he's very without a net, without a safety net. Like he feels like he has no, um, not as much control. Like as you know, security. He's he's insecure. I'd say so. Now I think that paints a picture, an another picture. But now he's staying at this um, very much ge filled with geishas, this hot spring area um, in this very isolated little like area of the country, but it's, it's very, very, not only is it freezing cold, but it's also, it's named snow country for a reason. It's, a, you know, the snow is like piled on high. It's supposed to be, I think, in the, it's supposed to be, I believe, the most amount of snowfall, per, not just per capita, but like in that, in Japan, not just Japan, but like it, in the world. Like I think the amount of snowfall is like anywhere from 9 to 15 feet. Um, so yeah, that, that is a lot. Um, I mean, definitely the kind of snow that I've experienced my, like the, the 2010 blizzard, I think was like, you know, completely, not, not nothing, it was, uh, you know, was uh, like a cakewalk compared to what the Japanese have, probably have to deal with on a daily basis on, on down there. So um, anyway, but yeah, that is, so he's very much kind of out in this and like he's in the mountains. He's trying to get away, um, our protagonist. He's trying to kind of slip away into the mountains. Like he's, um, but then he's introduced to a geisha named Kumike. And she is a very bright, affable, if somewhat idealistic, if a little bit quixotic, uh, young woman and she's probably I think in her late teens and she uh talks about her journaling and that she's like been keeping this journal and like talk in talking every day trying to write her thoughts down and she's also very good at the ballet and there's a strong kind of um you know she has a very strong moral sense of like you know she has a very strong um she's like very she doesn't want to and this is something that you know the um kind of not exact terms, but I think one in, in the um, preface to it that someone was like saying that, or I think Kawabata was maybe writing about this himself, that he, the word geisha was kind of, uh, in this context, the was al was almost, and it was based off, partially off a real person. Um, it was the onsan geisha Matsui was, um, of whom there's like a picture you can look online, um, that was kind of a kind of a partial like kind of prototype for uh, Kumike and the other geishas. Um, so I think that kind of drawing from real life and a part of the fact that geishas were also said to be kind of um, the thin line between prostitution and geisha work were kind of, there was a thinning, it was a thin kind of thing, even though, <gasps> excuse me, um, even though the, um, it wasn't illegal in Japan, I don't think, I don't think prostitution was criminalized at, until the 50s. So I think um, this is, uh, and by the way, this was written in 1935, I think initially it was 35, 6, six or 7, but he, um, Kawabata actually kept going back to this one, um, uh, short story, or this novella, over and over again. Um, and it is a quick, pretty, fairly quick read, um, probably take a couple days, maybe, um, two or three days if you're reading leisurely. Um, probably no more than maybe a few, a four or five hours. But yeah, he uh, kept going back to perfect it, and I think the last kind of effort of his was in the seventies before he passed away. And um, yeah, um, Yan Yasunari Kawabata was a um, he uh, was born in eighteen ninety nine, um, same year as Nabokov, and uh, passed away in the nineteen seventy two or three, I think. Um, so I think like right before his death, I think he like put, like one last final draft perfecting this. Um, and yeah, he, um, it definitely, you know, sh I think the version I read, for what it's worth, I think was the kind of fully kind of fledged version and that, um, the most thoroughly kind of edited. And yeah, I think this is like, so it's like a look into these two lives of, um, disparate lives of Kumike and, um, Shimanari who are kind of polar opposites in a way, like one of them is very, you know, uh, you know, Kumike is obviously the more emotionally um, open, and she's very open, and she's, uh, you know, is like seeing, she's, but she's also um, very much um, like a lower class. She's like kind of, you know, like she, 
tries to hide a lot of what happened and like she had a, a mother I think uh, I think she said her mother passed away and then um, her mother was able to uh, she was um, is paying off she mentioned that she was trying to pay off the loan she was trying to like find a good like a little hospital for her mother and then but then I think another person there's rumors floating around that she was also trying to she went to school and she's basically getting geisha work to kind of pay off the school so Kumake kind of has a a little bit of a rough past where she's like thrust into this kind of world of like she's you know like artistic you know bright obviously promising um but at the same time she's trapped under these circumstances of having to you know kind of bl blur the line in between like this kind of work of like pleasing men and being very it's very kind of you know there's a lot of like an aesthetic kind of um choreographed it's very there's a lot of uh you know there's a whole tra tradition of geisha work which is very much um almost like a part dancing almost part you know and there's a lot of you know it's with the dresses and you know the, the, the culture of it it's very um visual it's a very visually immersive kind of thing and um you have this kind of image of her being caught in that and she's lo constantly kind of looking for a way out like a kind of a way to kind of get out of this work and to kind of latch onto something different and to find and to find different opportunities and there's so many different opportunities out there but she's um, and she looks to um, Shumari, Sh uh, Shumanera, and he is completely closed off. Like, he has a love affair with her and um, and kind of and gives her, like, kind of leads her on and is, you know, so um, mistrust, you know, basically kind of, you know, fills a false kind of bond of trust and kind of, like, leads her into this kind of false sense of security and is like, yeah, like, yes, I will love you, I will take care of you, I will... You know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll get you a way out of here. But then all of a sudden, he'll, he'll like not show up, and then like completely, just completely, leave her hanging. And it's just like there's a, it's, there's a lot of um, kind of a push pull dynamic between them, where he's like suddenly he'll like show, um, reveal parts of himself, and he'll be intimate with her, and he'll he'll be very much confessional and like, and um, promise to like kind of um, find a way out of this kind of. Uh, dead end of this, you know, of this bleak kind of area, and then he'll, like, he'll say that, you know, he'll have, you know, connections out, outside, and then they'll go to maybe Tokyo or something, but then he, um, you know, completely, um, like, flakes out on these plans and, like, leaves her hanging and then kind of depressed, and then she's, like, very much kind of, like, emotionally distraught because of this, and then she's had other people do that, too, and there's a bit of a love triangle. I, I don't want to kind of dare say love triangle because... Um, the other two, um, woman, um, who is Yoko, uh, Yukio, and I think, uh, y yeah, Yoko, Yukio, and, um, was, uh, kind of another person where there's kind of, she kind of shows feelings for Shimonary, and he, uh, sees a little bit, is a little bit more partial to certain things of Yukio, and there's a bit of a, kind of a love, love triangle going on between Kumike and Yukio and Shimonero, where they're all kind of vying for one another's kind of affection and attention, but it's mainly the bond between uh, Kumiko and Shimonero that is portrayed in the novel. Um, but this fact that where he's kind of playing with her and manipulating her, and that's like very kind of sowing seeds of distrust and to the point where she's like, you know, uh, like. Where she like burst out and then in a in a huge kind of just very hugely uh, distraught, just over you know just very overwhelmed and just like emotionally exhausted, just fatigued from the amount of how much this uh, guy is just like messing with her. And he's just like, do you like you know he's like constantly she's constantly asking him like, do you actually care? Like why do you why do you tell me these lies? Like why are you doing like why do you do this to me to to torture me? And then he's like. Um, and then he'll, like, just kind of rebound into that kind of, um, aloof, icy, cold disposition of just, like, not, not going to tell anything. And it's very kind of a, almost Japanese patriarchal kind of thing, if I, uh, for lack of a better kind of, uh, way of describing it. But it, it is a very kind of, like, this kind of emotionally kind of, um, the men of Japan seem to have a little bit less, um, take and or grasp on their emotions or more of a distance and this is kind of during or right about pre right about um world war ii so obviously japanese militarism 
and the whole you know the military kind of complex of Japan too it's like into the, the huge imperialistic kind of thing going on that trend and phenomenon of Japan being very much like wanting to you know take seize power and wanting to take over different countries you know invading Manchuria for you know like th I think like at least twice I think there's two different uh, things and then various other wars and civil wars and you know uh, you know, I think the invasion of China at some point as well. So it's this thing of, um, and then of course, you know, World War II as well, you know, all leading up to, you know, Pearl Harbor and that this uh, kind of a warring kind of almost tribal mentality. Um, so you have that kind of thing. And then there's also a interesting thing too with the uh, technology too. Uh, Kaobata describes, um, you know, there being tap water and uh, snow plows and trains and all these, you know, and automobiles and um, and different kind of things to like electric kind of systems that were able to kind of warn, uh, like heating, like I think uh, uh, smoke detector too. So, um, and that's kind of how it ends too. A spoiler alert. Huh? Uh, I think if you don't get the impression that I was gonna kind of give, if I got, if I gave, in, if I gave that much away, then obviously I'm gonna probably give the rest away. But yeah, it does end kind of in a very um, kind of a pretty dramatic uh, manner at the when there's a fire that occurs and that somebody ha it's not there's I don't think there's any foul play to be suspected but there is a, um, a incidental fire from what we know that sets the entire um, geisha you know uh, hot spring resort on fire on a blaze and it is basically um, Yukio almost kind of fall and almost kind of gets stuck in there but she'll she's able to kind of jump out and um they're just watching this fire and like it's like almost like the uh almost like a perfect kind of culmination of an ending because it's like uh shimanari is was so like emotionally distant and cold and he's now seeing this from afar like now he's him and kumike kind of watch this almost as if like that fire is like resemble kind of emblematic of their relationship you know like they're just falling in flames like everything just kind of going to falling to pieces and now he's you know there's nothing that they can do about it and um yeah they there's been so many kind of turbulent ups and downs and um mainly kind of downs but yeah um and but yeah and another thing with um with the whole ballet kind of thing the art of it um the way performance put on and like how much uh like kumike would spend on a uh this kind of very precious kind of um fabric and like to him to uh shimonero like it was like just kind of like child's play like it was like he was so rich that this thing that she spent so long trying to get to trying to sew together and um uh craft and trying to piece together was like kind of just like it was like it was like nothing to him it was like you know it was like um that kind of is another kind of thing of their uh, starkly kind of juxtaposed, juxtaposed, juxtaposed um, class system of like statuses being kind of obvious at that point. Um, and another thing to do um, was that Kumike too was like in the ballet, the art, you know, kind of actually trained with the ballet. She's talking about, you know, the music pieces that's being set to it, kind of almost in the sense of a um, libretto, um, and yeah, she's, you know, written this stuff down, she's very good at it, but at the same time, it's like, now that, um, you know, that human has finally seen this ballet thing, like, it's like, kind of like, it's, it's still like, it wasn't enough for him, like, he's still kind of not impressed, like, nothing, nothing seems to phase him throughout the whole thing, um, but yeah, that is, I believe, all I have for Snow Country by Yasuneri, um, Kawabata. And yes, I have more. This is my first one by him, and I have more um, on my list by him. Um, and yeah, that um, I do have a, another review of Breast and Eggs by Miyoko Karakami that might actually have to be audio only because I was like idiotic enough to render out the file as a thing that only has that only has audio in it. So I before I deleted the raw footage, so I.